Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Susan Hayes against the bill, representing myself, and I'm going to explain to you why, because I fear that may disappoint you. Uh, I have represented kids in foster care. Um, as recently as last year, I represented a teenager in foster care. I also represented a two-year-old who was taken into the foster care system from the FLDS compound in West Texas, if some of you remember that incident. I read this bill when I heard about it and looked at the language and had some deep concerns with how broadly it was written, particularly given my experience with the realities of kids in our foster care system and their lack of access to any means to vindicate their best interest and their lack of access to legal counsel because how isolating foster care can be. We should be very careful how big and thick of a shield you construct around foster care providers because we do know there's pretty wide scale abuse within the system, whether it's a secular placement or a religious placement. And we do know religious organizations are often, too often, the location of sex abuse of children. I'm worried about when legislation like this is put in place and we already have a system that is overtaxed to say the least, uh, employees of the state who are very skittish to say or do anything that might upset the state's leaders or might cause controversy, and particularly when that comes to pregnant girls that are in the system, and there's a significant number of those. Um, I have to say I found it extremely disheartened to hear the representative of the Catholic bishops say they take care of refugees because they don't sue us, because I know what's happened to the refugees who are coming across the border from Central America who have been subject to systematic rape at the hands of coyotes or sex trafficking and arrive here pregnant and taken into what is essentially custody, whether it's in a private care provider or with the federal government or put into foster care. If they don't have access to a doctor to reproductive health care, they're forced to continue the pregnancy and bear a rapist child. With CPS, I think some, Representative Rodriguez says you had some questions earlier about access to abortion within CPS. Um, and I wanted, because I am a nerd and I like to read statutes very carefully, and I like to read bills very carefully and think about how they fit into the overall legislative scheme within our CPS statutes or our other child care statutes. CPS currently, by its own policies, will not help someone in their care access abortion. There was originally in Chapter 33 of the Family Code some language that required CPS to help adolescent girls who wanted to have abortions access the court system to get a judicial bypass. This legislature removed that language last session in HB 3994. And I really wish I could see committee substitute of this bill. I'd like to look at the language. I did notice in the current draft of the bill, as introduced on page 6, subsection G, there's some nice language. This would not allow the Child Welfare Services to deprive a minor of the rights, including the rights to medical care, provided by chapters 33, 263, and 266. You left out chapter 33. I have a whole lot more to say about this. Well, but your time is up. I understand so that. You. I will like you know, any you, questions. The and, I would, and you came out again. So yeah, you did you feel it? You feel here. it? Okay. And it's also someone who's sat and talked to these kids and listened to what's happened to them and listened to talk to a girl who was raped repeatedly in foster care and no one helped. And that's why we're here today. And to, I really to, want to, to make fix, that not happen yeah. again. And that's why we're that's why we put so much effort into mm -hmm. it this session. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I know that we've been here a long time, but on the uh, on, on CPS uh, and their ability to come in, mm -hmm. do you know, in your experience, then the process, if they were to come in in a case where you know, sexual assault or whatever, is it up to the child to call and contact CPS, or that's do they do they reg do they come in pretty regularly? I don't know this process. You know. I'm well, and that's it. just it. the child has very little access to help. And I know you don't believe me, Mr. Chairman, but I do see some middle ground in here with this bill and what we're trying to accomplish in trying to shore up the weaknesses of the CPS system. Mm -hmm. um, children in the CPS system have a caseworker. They have a guardian ad litem, usually from CASA, and they have an attorney ad litem appointed by the courts. 
caseworker turnover is extremely high, as you know, probably painfully aware from being on the Joint Committee. Ad litems can be a more consistent force, but their access to the ad litem may be limited. Do, can they get to a telephone? Um, where, you know, where are they? Mm -hmm. Are they in a place where they have access? I mean, I, I had a, a client who was in CPS care who was a runaway, <clears throat> and she messaged me over social media and surfaced. Um, but how we don't have safeguards built in. This bill might be a beautiful vehicle for safeguards for foster kids to have a way to reach out and ask for help or have a way to reach out and say, I'm not comfortable here. And one other thing you have to remember about kids, the worse the abuse, the less likely it is they're going to speak up. Right. So the best interest of the child, and we keep talking about that. Um, now, so that that's all seems to be just through case law, not so much Well, it, two problems with it. It's a right without a remedy from the point of view of the child. And one thing that disturbed me about this bill, as written, and it can be written, rewritten beautifully, um, it's all about the provider's rights and not the child's rights. Yes, that's there, but I know that. and here's another gap in our laws, because, again, I'm a nerd. I like to read them together. Mm -hmm. Parents have a duty to support their children until they're 18, but, and I forget if it's 15 or 16, but right in that age length, and that's right about the time LBGT kids may be getting kicked out of their homes. The child doesn't have a right to go force their parents to support them at all. Parents can throw out a children. They can be criminally prosecuted but only until the child is in the middle of adolescence. It's okay to kick your 17-year-old out in this state. That's allowed. And CPS doesn't have any bandwidth for them. So they end up on the streets or they end up in a care situation where they're subject to sex abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony.